So I'm Adnan Darwish. I'm a professor and chairman of uh, the computer science department at UCLA. So this talk is a little bit different than the previous two ones. It's uh, by more of a personal perspective on AI and what we need to educate the next uh, generation of uh, researchers and, and uh, practitioners. Um, so I will, I'll start by uh, maybe uh, sharing with you some of the headlines we see today about AI. Uh, these are actually all from uh, the ACM alerts that many of us get every week. So you see AI reading minds, detecting deception, uh, predicting public corruption, recognizing emotions, uh, you know, from your eyes can tell your personality trait. Um, and you see all of these things and then of course we're seeing the implications. Everybody wants to study AI, uh, whether students or researchers. Uh, governments and industries want to invest in AI and some people are fearing AI these days, uh, public and some academic and thinkers are warning, you know, you see the titles and, and those are just a few. You can imagine why people would feel this way. And of course, academic institutions want to teach more AI, right? Uh, there's a big demand now. And uh, one of the questions is, uh, what do you teach? How do you actually prepare uh, people um, in AI, given all of these uh, developments? So there is a dilemma from this point of view. In the sense that if you look at the, at least the undergraduate uh, curriculum in AI, it almost not, did not change, even though we're seeing all of this uh, interesting things happening out in the real world. And even at the graduate level, okay, you add the course on deep learning. So it's, so there's a discrepancy between how much is happening out there and between what's going on in, academically in the classroom. And then you say, well, what about all of these things? Emotions, personality, deception. I mean, well, interestingly enough, we haven't learned about these things much beyond or before these applications. Late in the 80s and early 90s in AI, people were studying intentions and goals and knowledge and beliefs. You could take courses on these subjects. People were trying to formalize them. There was like deep studies into these areas, but not here. What's going on here is something very different. And uh, the, the theme here, the one theme in this talk is we really need to get a sense of what's happening actually so that we know what we're gonna do next. And for that, I'm gonna actually uh, make use of a couple of slides based on this article uh, that I wrote uh, with the title Human Level Intelligence or Animal-like Abilities. Uh, it has a subtitle, uh, What Just Happened in AI and How It's Being Misunderstood. Uh, this is actually will appear next month on the cover of the CACM and it talks about the state of AI more generally. Uh, but it, it has a distinction that I would like to appeal to here, which is this distinction between what I call model-based versus function-based approaches to AI. So if you look at a task like this one where you're trying to localize objects in an image, the classical traditional approach for solving this and similar problems is, is the model-based approach where you represent information about dogs and hats and then you use automated reasoning to solve this kind of a problem. You use logic and probabilities as the tools and mathematical modelings more generally, but that's not what's happening today, right? So we, we know all now what's really behind most of these applications is what I call the function-based approach where I don't want to represent knowledge, I don't want to model, I don't want to reason, I just want to build a black box, right? So you give me pixels from the image, these are high level recognitions, and uh, just give me data. Input, output, and I will try to fit a box that maps this input to the output. I don't need to know what's going on underneath, and as we know, the neural network is the, the main tool today for building these mappings. What's interesting is, uh, very uh, simple approach that's familiar to college students, right? We've, we've done this in first and second year college when we fit simple polynomials to data in a chemistry or physics lab, except that we're doing this at a much larger scale. And what's happening with all of these applications is just building boxes of this type without really digging deep into what's happening in these underlying phenomena. But how could this explain all of this, uh, uh, you know, widespread applications of AI. What we really discovered, and again, this is important for, for the next slide on implications on curriculum, is that some tasks that we typically associate with perception or cognition and therefore have been traditionally tackled by AI, we now found that they can be approximated and to a reasonable extent by simply fitting functions to data. That is without the need to understand or model these particular tasks. This is fantastic and has all kind of applications, but we have to realize this is not 
a discovery about AI or technology. It's more of a discovery about the structure of our world. Uh, and then you ask yourself, why now? We've had these tools for a long time. It's, it's, it's mostly scalability, right? So these boxes now can be built at a much larger scale. We have a lot more data, more computational power. And the size of these boxes and the, our ability to learn them got to the point where you can move this box and, and move around the world and just apply it to various things, and it's clicking. It's really allowing you to do all kind of things. That's actually what's happening. And uh, when you look at what you have to teach people to do this, again, at the technical level, you realize that you're teaching them something very little beyond what was already uh, known. So why is this important? Because if you look at <laughs> AI history, <laughs> you see it had like went through three uh, particular eras, right? Uh, originally, uh, there is the era of knowledge representation and reasoning, where it was all modeling, but uh, based on logic. And then late 80s, early 90s, we moved into the machine learning era. We're still doing modelings, plus building functions. Probability became the thing. And now we're into this era of neural networks or function fitting. Some of my colleagues call this curve fitting as well. Everybody was trained here more of a solid CS person. You know, CS was very connected to AI, and you had to have a solid AI, uh, uh, solid CS background in formal methods and logic and so on. When we shifted to this, uh, it was all statistics and optimization. The training in these methods dropped, almost vanished in, in many universities. And now we're getting to this point here, and it's becoming more like engineering. Really, to play this game and be effective, you just have to have a broad engineering background, even disconnected from this and, and from that. Uh, most of the folks just, you, you get to really be familiar with function fitting. You, you master a tool like uh, TensorFlow, and, and you can do a lot of interesting things. And that's where is the danger, is that as we're moving, we're kind of diluting the uh, backgrounds and educational backgrounds of AI researchers. Now, look what happened now. When we moved from this to that, those folks were screaming to those folks saying, no, no, you're going in the wrong direction. You're, you're ignoring this to the point where you can have a crisis later. And this was ignored. Now, when we moved from this to that, these guys are basically <laughs> screaming to these guys, wait a minute, you know, what, what about graphical models? What about all of these interesting things? But look what happened. This is about 20 years. It was almost no, no impact. It was going in the same direction. Now, with about five years of progress on this, just last week, DARPA announced this $2 billion AI Next initiative. And here's the main statement by the director of DARPA about what's going on here. Today, machines lack contextual reasoning capabilities, and their training must cover every eventuality, which is not only costly, but ultimately impossible. We want to explore how machines can acquire human-like communication and reasoning capabilities with the ability to recognize new situations and environments and adapt to them. If you look at more of the elaborations of the thinking and the directions behind this effort, you realize that we're basically, it's a deja vu. <laughs> we're basically going back to saying we want this, right? And then you wonder, wait a minute, 20 years in this era, and that message didn't get across. How come now that we succeeded, suddenly the message is, is getting across? You know what I tell people? I tell people, if you make progress this fast, you also see limitations this fast. The greatest thing that happened in AI recently is that we started deploying. And once you start deploying, you hit realities. We can't live in our own bubbles in conferences. We start hitting the real things. One of the real things we started, for example, is lack of robustness explainability. You can't explain systems, AI systems, without doing symbolic reasoning and, and, and using classical AI techniques. The same thing for robustness. So we're back to where it should be. But the problem is, because of what we've done historically, again, we have very little talent or expertise in this area, which is needed most. You know, I've been going to conferences on formal verification to try to recruit people that have uh, skills in logic because they're almost non-existent in AI today. And what we need to do is watch against having the exact same mistake again. Again, I mean, in a sense, it's fantastic that we're here because we're realizing that we need all of this, but we're realizing this because of real world considerations, not because of intellectual exercises, because that's what the world is actually telling us. And the, the message that I have here and that we'll end up with is, is just one slide saying that 
those institutions that will eventually end up distinguishing themselves and, and in a sense have the upper hand in terms of training the next generation of AI researchers uh, need to pay attention to uh, first providing students with perspectives and having them know about AI history which is a big problem these days. I, I taught a class had about more than 100 graduate students and I said how many people know about chatbots? Everybody raised their hand and I said how many of you know that the first chatbot was built in, in the 60s It's called Eliza? Everybody pulled their iPhones and started Googling Eliza. No clue. No clue. I mean, if you, if you go read the, the history, it's, it's basically, again, a deja vu, things repeating themselves. Part of the problem is when we're moving from one segment to the other in the history of AI, uh, we're almost hit by amnesia. And in fact, when we, when we moved from the classical AI to the machine learning, even the demographics of, of the AI community changed. They were not even computer scientists. They were coming from statistics and physics, not even know what happened in the last 20 or 30 years. And today, same problem. Go to NIPS, right? Talk to some of the people doing great work. They really don't know what happened in, in the last two, three decades in AI, which is a real problem. So we need students to know about the history of AI. We need them to have a perspective. And, and we need to develop a generation of AI researchers that is well-trained and, more important, appreciative of classical AI techniques, machine learning techniques, and computer science more broadly. I think it's being highlighted now. If you really want to take AI to the next level, you need solid computer science education. Uh, and I guess that's, that's basically the message that I have for this presentation. Thank you. You know, I'll tell you what. I tell, I tell students, you know when people do their resumes and they put this and then say other skills? They put, I do Java and Python and this and MATLAB. I told them, soon enough, you're going to put deep learning there. Because it becomes so accessible and it's, it's not going to be a distinguisher. It's going to be just like your MATLAB skills.